A typical air-cooled copper electromagnet will allow the current density of 20 amps per square millimeter. But this is not enough if one would like to generate high magnetic field. Pushing the current over the limit in such electromagnets may only cause a fault and even be a hazard. The solution to this problem is a specially designed water-cooled bitter type electromagnet or even liquid nitrogen cooled electromagnet. A typical bitter electromagnet is made from a perforated copper plates with insulated layers in between. The electromagnet is cooled by water at approximately 10 degrees Celsius at a high flow rate. The water goes in axial direction through the small holes in the bitter plates of the coil, efficiently cooling copper plates through which high current flows. Here is an example of a rather old bitter magnet which is cooled by the water from reservoir. As you may notice, the experiments are conducted at night when the water is cooler and electricity cheaper. To provide a high current to the bitter electromagnet, a powerful generators are used. As you will notice during this demonstration, generators are struggling to deliver sufficient value of the direct current to induce 18 Tesla in a bitter magnet. There were very few laboratories which had the big power generators for energizing magnets with coils like this. Maybe 10 laboratories in the world, and there was no prospect of a big market in the magnet direction. The Royal Society Mond Laboratory uh, was built for Peter Kapitza, uh, who, who had um, come from Russia in the 20s of the last century. Uh, uh, and decided of his own accord he was going to work with Rutherford, whether Rutherford liked it or not, he was going to work with Rutherford, uh, and uh, Rutherford came to like it very much indeed, uh, but by the 30s, uh, Kapitza needed uh, a laboratory in which he could make his impulsive magnetic fields. He had, he had ideas for making extremely strong magnetic fields up to 30 Tesla, which was quite unheard of in those days, um, impulsively by um, spinning up a generator to full speed and then shorting it across a coil. So you get a, a terrific bang. Uh, and he needed a special laboratory where the bang uh, would occur at one end and the measurements would have been done before the bang got there. In the 1930s, the basic experimental apparatus, in which they had to make those measurements before the apparatus was disturbed by the arrival of the shockwave from the other end of the building. And for the rest, there was a student reading room upstairs, a library, and there were staff offices on, up on that floor there. Perhaps conscious that we were part of a very important as I said, golden age, though I think perhaps it's been born on, on us much later in life. There is a way to reach the higher magnetic fields by using pulse technique. In this chapter, the range of pulse electromagnet systems will be presented, ranging from 15 Tesla to 300 Tesla. The challenge is not only to generate high fields, but above all, to measure the critical current of the superconducting sample during magnetic flux pulse. For high field range and short pulses time, data interpretation can also be a challenge. First of all, we have the magnetic field with a flat top, and during this flat top, we pulse the current. The current pulse is of 4 milliseconds, whereas the magnetic pulse is of 15 milliseconds. This cryobi pulse is able to generate a magnetic pulse with a magnitude up to 32 Tesla with this coil. Construction of the 50 Tesla pulse magnet is not a trivial task because electromagnet winding has a hybrid structure and requires advanced engineering. The grey uh, boxes which you see are individual capacitors and all of them counted together supply an energy of in total one and a half megajoule. 
The voltage for this capacitor is relatively low, it's about 5 kV. And nowadays, people are going uh, in the modern installations up to, let's say, 25 kV. And the newest installation, which is being built up now in Dresden, will have about 50 megajoule. The higher the energy, the higher the magnetic field that you can create, and also the longer the pulse duration will be. The longer the pulse duration, the more easy it will be to do the experiments. Although you can do quite well experiments in about 25 milliseconds, if you, for instance, have a second or so, things will become even easier. So what happens here? All this energy is switched to the rooms where we have the experiments. So you have seen in the other in the capacitor room that you have these big cables, and using these big cables, the energy arrives here. We have about up to 30,000 amps, which is going through this rod inside a magnet which is cooled down with liquid nitrogen. And in principle, 80 Tesla is one of the maxima, the, the highest field values that you can get. Um, but that's, this is not all. You can go to other techniques, for instance the um, single turn coils. Single turn coils are a very uh, simple concept. You have basically a very big uh, copper uh, plate which you bend around, you put an insulator at one side and where you have the bending you actually make a magnet. It's a very very simple uh, idea. But you can put very extremely high currents to that. In that case uh, you will be able to make magnetic fields up to uh, several hundreds of Tesla, even up to let's say 300 Tesla. These fields are no longer non-destructive. You destroy in this case the coil there are people who even can measure transport in such a coil, which is really a big achievement. The time of such a pulse is also about, let's say, in a microsecond range, about 10 microseconds, 20 microseconds. This is the price that you pay for the high field. In applications where high but a very uniform and stable DC magnetic field is required, the pulse high magnetic fields are not very welcome. Second of November, 1961. I know this precise date as I was there with my wife. We were attending a conference in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where a small band of the magnet designers of the world were meeting. And we heard that, that in several American laboratories, some startling new superconducting materials had been discovered. Mostly alloys of niobium had been found, which could indeed carry high currents in high magnetic fields. These discoveries held the possibility of developing radical new devices, not only high field magnets which would need no power, but for all forms of equipment using electric current. In 1962, Martin Wood, founder of Oxford Instruments, has made the first relatively small superconducting electromagnet, generating a flux density of little more than two Tesla. Today, a DC superconducting electromagnet produced by his company can generate an trap flux density of 20 Tesla. Obviously there are other companies producing high field superconducting electromagnets. There is also a cryogen free technology which allows superconducting electromagnets with a wide range of fields and dimensions to be built without the need of liquid cryogens. In pursuit of high magnetic fields, high temperature superconducting materials play a significant role. Here is an example of IPCO magnets made from coated conductor that generates 26.8 Tesla in background field on the resistive magnet.